Bibles, turn to 1 Peter. Chapter 4, we're getting close to the end of this book. You know, where we live and when we live has a great deal to do with how we live. There's some folks today that's living right in a place of danger, but yet they're not aware that they are in that place of danger. They're living in a place of danger. Uh, if you remember, you don't hear much about it anymore. It used to be on the news just about weekly. But down in Florida, they used to have, and I guess they still have them, but it's not a rarity anymore, but what they called sinkholes. Uh, people would come in, get up in the morning to leave, go to work, and they'd walk out and their car is gone. There'd just be a big See black hole person. there where it swallowed that car. Come home and leave them, their houses would be swallowed up and their house gone, a black hole in its place. Welcome to the Lewisburg Baptist Church live stream. We want to thank you, you for joining us. And a great deal on how you live. Basically, that's what Peter's telling us today in these verses that we'll look at. Uh, he said, since we're born again believers, that we are living on the very edge near the end of the time when the Lord will return, when he's coming. Peter wrote that. He believed that. So he's saying we ought to be spending our days in a certain way, how we ought to be spending those days as we approach that time. So begin with me in verse chapter 4, verse 7. As Welcome we to the Lewisburg Baptist Church live stream. Serving God. We want to thank you for joining yeah, us for and we'd love glory. to see you in person. Verse Our 7. But the end of shortly. all things is at hand. Speaking of the Lord's Crash return. Music goes Therefore be serious and, and watchful in your prayer. And, cornbread, please. and above all things, Amen. have fervent love. If you like bluegrass and soup beans, for love will like cover a multitude right. of sins. Uh, well, a lot of people so you try to take that as a doctrine and live on that. And I try to hopefully explain that for you. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, Minister it to one another as a good steward of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. That in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong to the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you again, Lord, for your word, and thank you for this day, and Lord, just the opportunity again to be in the house of God, to study your word. Lord, we pray again today for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon this place, for your presence in this service, Lord, not upon just your, your, your servant, your pastor, Lord, but your, uh, your congregation. We pray, Lord, that you just speak to every person's heart here today, that you anoint them from on high, that conviction will be placed upon them, that they'll be receptive to what you have for them, that they might hear the things of God. Lord, we love you. We thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now, it's been over 2,000 years since Peter wrote these words saying that the end is near. But he's not the only one. John in the book of Revelation tells us that the end time is near. Paul says this a couple of places in his writing that the Lord is at hand even in Timothy. He says in the last days he's, he, uh, about Christ's return. So these writers, are they uh, just reaching for some pie in the sky ideal? Was they wrong in saying that uh, Jesus' return is near? Uh, I don't believe so. Matter of fact, I know so. What you got to remember and keep in mind, these writers, when they wrote these words, were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. So they wrote from the viewpoint of spiritual and eternity things, not from the worldly view that we have today. God told his prophet Isaiah these words, Your ways are not my ways, nor are your thoughts my thoughts, says the Lord. Peter even tells us that God doesn't count time as we count time. Peter tells us that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So really, if you look at it from that point of view, from God's viewpoint, beloved, it's only been a couple of days since Peter wrote these words that the Lord's return is near. 
So it's un important that we understand today that we are living closer to the end of time than ever before. Uh, you could say that we are living on the edge of Jesus' appearance. Uh, we need to understand that. We need to grasp that. Uh, not too long ago on Sunday nights, we studied uh, this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the next great event, uh, spiritually speaking, is the rapture of the, what we call the rapture of the church. The snatching away of the born again believers. That's the next event on the calendar. That's the next thing that's going to happen. And we studied that, all that on Sunday night. And if you attended those by now, I hope that you believe as I do that there will be some in this room today that will not experience death. But they will be taken away, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. air. Paul tells us that over in uh, 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians, that, uh, that that's going to happen, that the trumpet's going to sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, those that remain, those that are not dead, will be caught up next, together, in there. So that day is coming, and it's, we will experience that, and some in this room will not experience death, but will actually experience the rapture. I believe that with all my heart. Then, when that happens, time as we know it will be no more. It's not going to be no more. If you're lost without Christ, as the song says, we're gone. You're still on this earth. And things, will, you think it's bad now? Man, it's going to be terrible then. You just, uh, it's beginning the seven years of tribulation. Those roll around one after another. You have the uh, uh, seven... Uh, vials will be poured out on this earth. All kinds of stuff happening. Uh, the demons of hell will be released upon this like scorpions, the biggest horses that sting but cannot kill. All that will be coming upon this earth. So, Peter says, since you are living on the edge, you're on that edge of his appearance, there's ways that we ought to be living. Uh, people say, man, you're always getting after us how we're living. Yeah, amen. You see, I, I'm not beating you up. I don't want to. Uh, I, I wish I could just come in here and sit here and worship like you do. But uh, study God's word and Peter's just getting us ready for that day. And he says there's ways that we ought to be living. There's attitudes that ought to be in our life today especially since we're standing on the uh, edge of Christ's appearing. Now, the first attitude he gives us in verse 7, he says, but the end of all times is at hand. Now, since that's the way, he says, therefore, so since the end of times is at hand, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Uh, being watchful is not putting on a white robe and running to the tallest mountain or climbing the highest tree to sit there and wait on Jesus to return. But we're to go about our business, but not like the world does, because the world, beloved, doesn't believe he's coming. Peter addresses that in 2 Peter when he talks about God's not slacking concerning his promises. He said, some's going to come mocking it. Where's his appearance? You've been saying that for 2,000 years. Where's he at? And he says, God's not slack concerning his promises. And that's when he tells us one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So uh, what are we to do? Uh, we're not be like the world because we know that Jesus can come at any moment. So Peter says, be serious. I think the King James says to uh, uh, be sober-minded. That's not talking about drinking or going with a sad sack look on your face and down in the dumps all the time, but it means to have a calm and a clear mind. Be cool and calm and collective in an insane world. Now Paul tells us in these last days, he said some will turn away from the faith. We see that today. He said they'll turn to deceitful spirits and the doctrine of demons. We see that today. He also said that stressful times would be upon us. 
That men would become lovers of self and lovers of money, boastful, unholy, disobedient to their parents, ungodly, haters of God, and lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Now, I don't know if you people know this, but this world we live in has gone crazy. Amen? A world that's become insane. Now, the difference between sanity and insanity is this. A sane person sees things in their proper balance. We see this world's going crazy, and we know that. They see what's between real and what is unreal, while the insane person has lost the proper balance between what is real and it's what is unreal. And as you see the day, beloved, this reality TV we know is not real. But yet, it's playing to the masses and it seems like more and more of them are coming out. All you got to do is look and listen to the talking heads and the p politicians that's in this country today. What's happening in our world today. Uh, my daughter and son says, you mean you actually listen or watch CNN or M M MSNBC? I said, well, yeah. Because I just got to see how insane people have really become. They want to ban every gun in this country. But alcohol and drug deaths kill three times more than a gun does. Look at the million abortions. Right now they're ringing their bell because abortions has dropped from 800 and some thousand this year so far to 600 and some thousand. That's how many unborn babies are killed this year in America. We've killed billions of babies, but yet they won't ban that. But they want to ban something that's given to us by our constitutional right. They've even made it legal to abort a child. They'll say it's legal to abort a child, but you kill a deer that's pregnant, <laughs> and you're going to pay for both deers. Uh, it's contradicting. You show, see what I'm talking about, the reality of it all? Then they talk about free health care for the illegals that's come in this country illegally. Give them free health care while the veterans are dying while they wait to get an appointment in a hospital. One candidate said this, he would give every, every person in America $10,000 a year. Uh, where's he gonna get that money? To include free education, free health care for all these people, and all this. Is that really real? Uh, you know that lovers of money, that I talked about in the last days, Paul says they become lovers of money. That's, they think that's how they're going to get elected. If I can forgive all college debts, give everybody free housing, food, clothing, and they don't have to work, that's lovers of money. That's lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. But we don't hear that. The world has become a madhouse and the inmates are running. That's what we've gotten into in our society. We need to keep our balance when it comes to Jesus' return, until he returns. Uh, we've taken that, born-again believers have, and they've switched that. They've become unstable in their think, thinking on the return of Jesus Christ. Today, many go to the extreme of trying to Set a date when he comes. The Bible says nobody knows. Not even the Son. It's only God knows when that's going to happen. Others live like it's never going to happen. I'm talking about born again believers. That's, that's the extreme we went to. To uh, setting a date till he's not really coming. And that's the thought that's prevalent. So how do we keep a sane mind... How do we keep our balance in this time that we're living in? Well, in the end of verse 7, Peter tells us to be serious and watchful. So we talked about what that is. Then he says, in our prayers. 
Well, this is an important thing. Peter, it meant a lot to Peter when he wrote that because Peter experienced about being watchful in his prayers. I want you to take your Bibles. Turn to Mark chapter 14. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Fourteen verse thirty-two. A lot of reading, but that's fine. You'll get there. You there? Say amen. I love reading this story. Then they came to this place, which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, "Sit here while while I pray." So he brought it all his disciples. He said, "You sit here while I pray." Then he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Uh, I think it's Matthew said he moved off a little bit from those, uh, from the other disciples. And he took these three disciples with him. Then he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Now look what he says. Stay here and watch. And he went a little further, and he fell on the ground, and he prayed that he, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible from me, for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You see, that's, that's just simply denying yourself. You know, we, we pray that prayer different. We say, Lord, not your will, but my will be done. And then we can't figure out why we living in the troubled times we're living in. And then verse 37, then he came and found them sleeping. Now listen who he said this to. Listen who he addressed. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray. Lest, now circle this, you enter into temptation. Uh, I hear this a lot, especially from born-again believers. Lord, look, I'm just tempted constantly, all the time. Every time I'm turned around, I'm tempted by something or somebody. The devil's after me constantly. He asked you a question. How much praying are you doing? Jesus says, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. See, if you're falling for temptation a lot, it, it, don't run to the preacher. Don't blame the church. Don't blame God. Blame yourself if you're not praying. Amen? Just a little uh, added, that didn't cost you a dime this morning. That's free. Okay? Then it, I love this. This is my problem right here today. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, my spirit's willing to do a lot of things, but this old fleshly body is too weak. And that's what we run into. As we grow older, those things happen. But beloved, we never, ever get too old to pray. We never get too bad of shape that we don't pray. That can never happen to us. So don't buy into that what they say, okay? Now, I need to go on. I get into this stuff and I don't... Then he came a third time. Oh, and again he went away and he prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time. And he said to them, are you still sleeping? And resting it is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. He's talking about Judas who come up and kissed him. Had these soldiers and they all come to arrest Jesus. But I want you to look in verse 47. They took Jesus, grabbed him. And then it says, And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now, the Gospel of John tells us that was Peter. Peter did that. Praise the Lord, his aim was bad because he was going for the head. And he cut off his ear. Was it that or was it God intervened 
So today I could be preaching about Peter and the writings he did. You see, God's in control of everything, beloved. Don't ever doubt that he's not in control even of the hard-headed, stubborn man. Amen? Let me ask you something. Would you just, just answer in your heart, have we grown so spiritually, have we become so uh, spiritually mature that we can neglect praying, that we don't have to pray? I, I, I want to kind of beat you up. I see that because we don't come to prayer meeting. We don't, we talk about, you can say you're going to have revival, you're going to have uh, Hunt, Brother Hunt here, you can have the cathedrals, you could have, uh, uh, I don't know, some of these modern day singers, some big speaker, uh, Beth Moore, and man, they flock to it. But you say, you're going to have a prayer meeting? They want nobody to show up. Are we that mature? Are we that spiritual strong that we can neglect praying? That's one thing that keeps us sane in an unsane world, beloved. If we neglect praying, we're asking for trouble. I don't care who you are, how long you've been saved, uh, how long you've served Jesus, you must be watchful and we must pray. Uh, think about this. Praying puts us in contact with Almighty God. With the eternity. It gives us a, a view of this world from eternity's perspective, from God's perspective, not the world. And it helps us keep our sanity in this insane world. Just five minutes every morning before you start your day can make a difference in your life. Five minutes. You know what can happen in five minutes in this world? I'm going to give you some stuff. Now listen to this. In five minutes, the earth revolves 6,000 times in its orbit. Five minutes. An electric current can circle the earth 6,000 times in five minutes. A ray of light can travel 55.9 million miles in five minutes. And in five minutes, you can soar past the moon, the stars, and enter into the very presence of the throne room of Almighty God and get orders, get God's plan for you that day. In five minutes, you can do that. And we can't give God five minutes. That's all he asked. Five minutes. Watch and pray. Oh, the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. See, it comes down to a priority. Uh, that night, you may have to go to bed 30 minutes early so you can get up and get ready and spend that five minutes in prayer. I mean, it's a priority thing we have to do. You have to discipline yourself. I get up, and I'm not bragging. I just, I've just i done this so many years. But I get up early every morning. Becky is asleep. She'd sleep a lot longer than I do. Because uh, I get up, and I'm off by myself to pray. i got to do that. i got to do that every day. Not just, I do it seven days a week. This morning, I was up before six praying before I've done anything else. It's the way I operate because I've learned over the years. My day begins with the Lord and that's what it's got to be with us, beloved. We have to be watchful and pray. We can't neglect praying. Second thing he says is uh, we need to be loving. Look at verse 8 and 9. And above all things. Now that kind of puts it in priority. Okay? Above all things. Have fervent love for one another. For love 
will carry a multitude of sins. Be hostile to each other, one another, without grumbling. You don't grumble about helping people. You see, we're to have a fervent, that means to stretch out. You know, when we pray, we, we can stretch out. When we love people, we're to stretch out. It's like a, a, a runner stretching just before they take off running. They do stretches. And love, he's talking about the same love Jesus had for us, that sacrificial love. And the whole ideal behind this, beloved, is that as born-again believers, we're not to live a self-centered life, but we're to give ourselves to others, to reach out to This is, keep in mind, we're, we're living on the edge of Jesus' return. So he said we ought to be uh, not living that selfish life that Paul says it's going to be at the end of uh, end days, end times, just before Jesus comes. But we're to give ourselves to others, reach out to others, and make it a priority in our life. Think about that. That's what you do. Now, I'm going to brag on you, and I don't do much, so don't beat me up because I said I, got, I, I get after you all the time. I'm going to brag on you. I see a lot of that in this church. So it's time you could take a bow, pat yourself on the back, but don't hurt your arm doing it. But a lot of you in this church do reach out to help each other, to help others. You see a need, you go. Now some of us is too prideful to ask for that help. You know, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors. We don't know what's going on in your home. We don't know how sick you are. So if you need help, ask somebody. And they'd be willing to reach out and help you. I've seen that throughout this church. That's one thing that I've seen in this church is we know how to reach out and help each other. And, and Peter says when we love in that kind of manner and we do those things, then we cover a multitude of sins. Boy, isn't that something? You cover people's sins when you do that. That comes from Proverbs 10 and 12, by the way, because if you notice that, it's kind of written it. And Hebrews, I mean Proverbs, it says hatred stirs up strife. I mean, if you've got hate within a church body, you've got a lot of strife. But love covers sin. Now, it doesn't mean that you condone sin, that you see your brother or sister in Christ and you say, okay, they're in sin, so I'm just going to ignore it and love them, and that'll cover their sins. No, that's not what he's talking about. But when we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, then we won't gossip. Uh, it has an idea of this, that you love with that sacrificial love. And that because I know that, and I know you love in that matter, that I can come to you and open up my heart. And in the morning, it won't be all over the church. You know, the telephone committee gets on and gets to going. It used to be telephone. Now it's probably Facebook and email. I, I see it on uh, people I know from other churches that I've, I've attended. I see them on Facebook and uh, I know about people seeing. Uh, you know, we, we know somebody that's in sin rather than trying to correct them and get them out of that sin and help them uh, to live right. Man, we run and gossip to everybody about how they're living. We, we ought not do that. It's not sacrificial love that Peter's talking about. We've got to do that. You know, one of the things that I miss in this church, and I, 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 it's not just this church, it's a pattern that's going on, is we don't confess anymore. Uh, you know, if I had done something in this church, I need to confess that. I don't get up here and say, hey, man, me and Becky's been fighting for the last six months and uh, I've been looking at other women. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. You just say, Lord, I, I, I've, church, I've sinned. I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Now help me in that. We don't do that anymore. I had a lady do that in a church I pastored at, and I had talked to her, and we had discussed some stuff, and there was a lot of gossip about her within that church body. And she was a hard worker in that church. She'd done a lot of stuff. Husband was a deacon, but there was a lot of gossip. So we talked, and she wasn't helping the goss gossip. So we talked, and uh, 
I told her what she needed to do. And uh, it, a month went by, and I figured she'd leave the church. She came one night, I think it was one Sunday night or one Sunday morning, and she said, I, I, I want to confess something. I sinned against the church, and I want you to forgive me. I'm willing to step down from anything I'm doing. It wasn't. A, it wasn't. It's just gossip mostly, but she fueled that gossip. And beloved, they just engulfed her, and she was shocked of how they responded. But see, but so many times we we can't wait wait to get out the back door and to go tell somebody. You know, that's what we miss. That's what Peter's saying. If you if you have that kind of love. That covers that sin. I, I know then I can talk to you. <laughs> Man, the loneliest position as a, as a pastor is a pastor. Because you've got to be careful of what they say. I want you to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's called the love chapter. This kind of sacrificial love has no limits. It's, it never says you've gone too far. Now, you, uh, you still love them, but you don't condone what they're doing. Okay? We, we especially balance that today with our kids and grandkids. Verse 4. Love suffers alone, and it's kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself is not puffed up. You know, one of the hardest things, uh, or one of the most distasteful things in a church is for you to get up and pat yourself on the back. Uh, man, look what I did today because I and remember that. I, I love them, and I, so I'm going to go over there and take care of that. Uh, it's not puffed up. does not behave rudely. Uh, I love you, but you're just a, you know what. <laughs> does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity. Uh, boy, we ought to weep. When we know a, 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 a fellow believer, sister, brother in Christ that's in sin, that's in iniquity, we ought to be weeping over them. Boy, I know that was going to happen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We all weep for them. But rejoice in the truth. Well, we hide the truth. Tell them. Just be truthful. Love them, but tell them. Bears all things, believe all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That all thing means everything. That means there's no end for your endurance. To that. Back in our text, Paul said to be hostile. Becky will get after me because I'm not saying that correctly. Without complaining. The early church had no buildings to hold their church service in. They, they went to each individual homes and did them. Some say the early church started the, the prayer uh, meeting they had before the coming of the Holy Spirit was in uh, Paul Mark's mother's house. But they just met at different places. You read Jesus go to Peter's house. He'd go to Sinner's house. So they didn't really have a place to meet. Uh, the people that Peter's writing to probably didn't have homes. They know they didn't have a church building, so they met where they could. They, they helped each other they, uh, to have church. Today, many churches have taken their, their uh, pastoral they had. Is that what you call it? They had a, most churches used to had homes that they owned. The church owned the home, and that's where the pastor would live because they didn't pay the pastor anything. So they said, okay, well, let you stay in this house. And uh, a lot of them now, pastors want their own home. So now they've taken that home and used it as a missionary, a fur furlong missionaries that's coming back to the States for two, three weeks, month or two, or a year. And they uh, just open it up for them and let them live in that until while they're here on uh, states on leave. Some open up their homes for Bible studies. 
But they're all done in a, in a purpose of helping each other. And that's what Peter's saying. We need to be reaching out with a sacrificial love and opening up our hearts and our lives to the lost to, to help reach people. Beloved, uh, Jesus says this is how they know you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. You see, if we can't love one another in our midst, what do you think the lost is going to think about us? It happens. Then he gives us the third attitude, which is service. Back in our text, you can hold your place right there in 1 Corinthians. We'll be back to that in a minute. But if you look at, in 1 Peter back at verse 10, uh, this is, uh, I'm not going to camp here, but I'm just going to say it. Okay, you there? Say amen. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. That in all things, now, you, you, got, you got to circle all things. Everything you do, everything that a church does is to bring glory to God. It, not to bring glory to yourself, but to bring glory. The gifts you're given is given so you can bring glory to God. If any one minute, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we do children's church. We do it for God's glory through Jesus Christ and not for ourselves. We do this world explorers we're going to try for the glory of God through Christ Jesus. That's the reason I tell people, everything we do, beloved Jesus, has got to be at the forefront. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Now, we can put on a pony and dog show to get people to come, but if you do that, you've got to continue with that pony and dog show to keep them coming. Uh, you, I, I, it's amazing to me how you can put a sign up there and say, we got a, we're going to have a fest here at the church and then we bring in the Budweiser beer trucks and the Coors Lights, and we put up Ferris, the, the Wheel of Fortune and uh, have cards and all that, and we draw a crowd. Did you say you're going to have a prayer, prayer meeting or you're going to preach in the name of Jesus? And look out. We're too busy. I noticed that down here at the uh, uh, Derby days. Uh, they had a gambling wheel or something set over there in the corner, man, that thing stayed packed. And up there where we were with gospel music being sung and a place for just them just to sit and relax. It was very sparse. Uh, that's the way we operate. That's the way the people are. We've got to bring glory to God. Back to this text. Ever saved Born again believer has as, as at least one or more spiritual gifts. He has one or more. They have one or more. You say, well, I don't know what it is. Maybe one day I can get into that, but it'll take a while. But I can tell you this, you're not going to find it by sitting on the sidelines. But God's given each one through the Holy Spirit. And we're to use these, these gifts to ministry, he says. That word ministry means to attend to or to serve one another. He didn't give it for us. You see, we've taken the spiritual gift in our churches. Boy, we've, uh, we have we made people feel bad about it. You, you watch some of the speaking in tongues and all this stuff that's going on today. And you sit there and watch that and you say, man, I can't do that. I don't have that gift, so I, I'm left out. No, you're not. Why, are you, why did God give it to us? For one another. Not for ourselves. To serve one another as good spirits, he says, as the manifold. That means multicolored. Think about that. 
Uh, all the multicolored gifts, God's grace is there to cover. All the problems you have, God has a grace for that problem. He can take care of it. Spiritual gifts are just the ability which God gives ever born again believer in order that they may serve him and his church is basically what I my definition of it that they're to use to minister to one another that's what it's about go to Romans chapter 12 Romans and 1 Corinthians and Peter here gives us the spiritual gifts and Ephesians uh, So if you're, read, if you're searching for your gift, read the Bible and it'll show you what those gifts are. Verse tw chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God of God. Verse 1 tells you to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Do that, number one. Number two is, don't you be conformed to the world. Uh, living like the world of this age. Don't, don't live that way. But live as if the new age, as Christ is already here. So that you might prove what the will of God is. And when you do that, then you will be able to use the gifts you have. That's what he tells us in verses 3 through 6. For I say that through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. I always say if you think too highly of yourself, go try to make somebody else's dog mind you. And he'll bring you down real quick. Amen. Or a little two-year-old or three-year-old. <laughs> but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So we all have faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members to one another having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And then he says, if prophecy, let us prophesize in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So you got all that. That's gifts. Now, I don't have all those gifts. Uh, Becky said I don't have much with mercy. <laughs> uh, so, you know, not everybody has those. But if you have them, then use them. Amen? I mean, it's not rocket scientists. In our service this morning, we have people with different gifts. That's manifold. Different gifts. Serving you, the church. What if our people who have their gift, of, let's say the same. Now, I'm going to kind of get after you. If you can sing, you better be singing. You got that? We, we'd redone this whole stage so we could have, fill it up with people singing. Uh, but what if you walked in this morning... There wasn't any bulletins, orders, or any of those things. The bulletin board back in the back was empty. The bathroom had no toilet paper, no paper towels, no soap, no water, because we didn't pay the bill. You want no electricity, because we didn't pay the bill. No song books, no pews. What if we didn't have a preacher? No singing, no preacher. How long would you come to this church? See what I'm saying? Amen. Everybody that has a gift was here this morning. Teachers was here. Workers was here taking care of the nursery. All this stuff went on 
so we could worship Almighty God. So it happened this morning. It, it, it was shown in this church. And we did it for each other. We did it so you could come. But what if they did? Now I want you to watch this though. There's not a need in this church that should ever go unattended. Every person that's a member, every person that's born again and saved has a gift. And verse 11 says that God gave us the ability to use that gift. You see, it's, we can't do it. You may be a, a teacher by trade, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's your gift here at church. You may be in, a, in finance, but that may not necessarily be your gift. You may have the gift of administration or a gift of teaching. God gives you that gift, and then he enables you. He gives you the ability to use that gift. You know, that's the most amazing thing to me. When I surrendered to preach, you think, I did it? I mean, I, I wouldn't even get up in a crowd. I didn't like speaking. I, Becky gets after me. All, everybody gets after me. said, I, I uh, abuse, they call it the King's English. We don't speak King's English. I speak Kentucky, which is better. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I said, Lord, I can't do that. We wrestled. Me and the Lord just battled constant. I said, I can't do it. And one morning he says, I know you can't, but I can. Just like Moses God told Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. You tell him, you're going to set my people free. Moses said, I can't do that. God said, yeah, you can. Kept, and then he said, I'll just be the mouth for you, Moses. You just go. God gave him ability to do that, beloved. He'll do the same for you. You just got to be willing. You got to be willing to do it. God added you to this church. Because he knows the gift that you have. And he'll give you the ability to use. This church needs that gift. You say, I thought it's doing pretty good. It is. But it's about the same amount of people. Uh, during VBS, I was so uh, elated in the people I seen doing VBS, helping with it. Some's not even a member of the church. You need to become a member. You say, there you are, after the membership. I'm not after membership. I want you in this church to serve us. This church and Jesus Christ. Nowhere does it say you'd be a lone ranger. I, I love what he says in Acts. God added to the church daily those that are saved. Now, we try to make that to be the universal church, baloney. It's not. It's the local Thriving, Bible preaching, Bible believing church. So God added you to this church. I always tell people you come to church not because that's where you wanted to be, that's where God wanted you to be. I've heard so many times people come, visitors, and shake their hand, talk to them, and they said, Been searching for a church for years, and I hadn't found one. Finally got one that preached the truth. And boy, I can't wait. And you never see them again. Something wrong. God adds you to the church. God brings you to this church for a specific reason because you have a specific gift that He wants to enable you to use. Not for yourself, but for someone else. We've already went over that. To help one another. You see, you just don't become a member because that's, that's what we've done. I don't like that church. They don't have the right music. I don't like that preacher. I don't like that deacon. I don't like that. If you're saved and born again, you don't go to the church because that's what you want to do. You just say, Lord, is this where I need to be? Is this my gift be used here? If it is, show me. Well, he showed a lot of you that your gifts need it. Now, you just need to make that commitment to do so. So that in all things, he may 
be glorified through Christ Jesus. Boy, if a church just did those things. Talk about glorifying God through Christ Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you're saved and born again and you have a gift, you do. Then use it. If you're here and you're not a member, then you need to become one. At the invitation, just come forward and say, Brother Wentz, I, I need to Become a member of this church. How do I do that? And then we'll show you how. We'll tell you how. Just do it. I always say, just do it. Why, why are you waiting? Remember, we're living on the edge. We're right here. And we're there. So just do it. And God will give you the ability to carry it out. And if you're here this morning and you're lost, you're living on the crumbling edge of eternity. You're right there. If y'all remember Mount St. Helens back in the state of Washington, I don't know how many years ago, they had this volcano there. And the story is about an old man, a mountain man, that lived up there next to that volcano. And when it got, I think his name, they called him Harry Truman. Uh, ain't that something? Not the president. This is an old mountain man. But he lived up next to that mountain and... and when it started acting up, people went to him and says, man, you need to get out of here. And he said, I ain't leaving. This is my home. I'm staying. Well, sure enough, it erupted. Ashes and everything spread for miles. It wiped everything out. And not, uh, Harry Truman was never heard or seen from again. He wouldn't leave. He was warned, but he wouldn't leave. So if you're here this morning and you're lost without Jesus Christ, this old world is about to blow up. And the banks of eternity is crumbling under your feet. And you don't stand to change a part of Jesus Christ. If you're outside of Christ, you don't stand to change. I'll do it later when I get a chance. Well, ain't going to be no later. You're there. So what you need to do now, today, not tomorrow, not tonight, not later on, but now, right now, is to commit yourself and your life to Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You see? Listen, if you're lost, you're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised the next 30 minutes. That trumpet could sound. The dead in Christ could be gone. You'd be sitting there alone. And then the tribulation begins. Today's the day. Now's the accepted time. So the invitation is simple today. You got a gift you're a member of this church, use it. We've got the nominating committee working right now trying to fill positions within the body of Christ so that no one would be left out. If you're here and you're born again and saved, don't say you're looking for a church home. God's got you here for a reason. Just do it. Just come during this hymn of invitation. Get up out of your seat. Don't let the hymn book stop you. Just come on down. And we'll talk. You, you haven't done nothing. Nobody's going to uh, uh, come knocking on your door and say, how come you come and you not do anything? Just come on. We'll talk. If you're lost without Christ, this is the urgent thing. You need to get saved right now. Amen. You need to say, Lord, I'm lost. Lord, I'm confessing. I need a Savior. I believe that you died. You was buried. You rose from the grave. And you can live in my life. And I want you to do that right now. Right here. You need to do that. Then come on. We're going to celebrate with you. Because we're going to rejoice in knowing that you're saved and born again. Let's pray. Our Father, again, the message is given. We pray, Lord, for the 
power of the Holy Spirit upon everyone here for the convicting power. Because, Lord, you can uh, touch people right where they sit. Lord, they know where they stand. They know what they need. So speak to them, I pray. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.